Okay, the classical theory that we just talked about, the rational choice theory, has uh, specific policy implications. And of course, the policy is deterrence, the idea that you raise the costs of crime and that deters people from committing crime. Now, we're gonna talk about another theory that forms the basis of a lot of sociological theories. Uh, that is an interesting theory because it has no policy implications of any kind. Right? Think about the biological theory. The idea is that you want to selectively incapacitate people that are biologically inferior. If those traits cause crime, then you want to identify people who have those traits and uh, segregate them. The classical theory, uh, obviously deterrence. But uh, this theory, which was uh, penned by uh, one of the founders of sociology, Emil Durkheim, really doesn't have any policy implications because what Durkheim says is that crime is necessary for society and that all societies have crime and all societies always will have crime. That crime is necessary and society can't function without crime. Now, that's a pretty odd idea um, and we'll explain it in detail. But think about how fascinated we are with crime in society. Think about how many primetime television shows uh, deal with crime. If I say names like uh, John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, you know who these people are. Think about the idea that mass murderers are celebrities and household names. Serial killers uh, are people that we, uh, we know the story of these people. Um, think about the, uh, the show Cops. You remember the show Cops? Bad boys, bad boys. Think about the idea that your job is so interesting that cameras follow you around while you do your everyday job. Why is there a show called Cops that follows cops around? You wouldn't see a show called Engineers that follow people around with their calculators and slide rules. Why is police work intrinsically interesting, but not other types of work? When the sociology department and the criminal justice department were combined and I taught in that department. I used to teach the introduction to criminal justice class and there were majors from all over. Um, business, economics, biology, chemistry, and they would all say, well, I'm just fascinated by you know, crime and the criminal mind. And uh, Durkheim would ask, why are we so interested in crime? Why are we so fascinated? And Durkheim asks, what would happen if we woke up tomorrow and there was no crime? Now, you may think to yourself, well, that would be great if we woke up tomorrow and there was no crime. But ask yourself, how many people would be out of work? Not just the cops. I mean, think about it. Lawyers, judges, social workers, locksmiths, people that do computer security, uh, if there was no crime overnight, all criminal justice majors would become history majors. Uh, so there are all there are thousands of people uh, in society uh, that depend on crime for their livelihood. And if crime disappeared, it would be manifestly bad for them. But Durkheim says not to worry. Uh, it's never going to happen. And there is a simple principle from Durkheim. Uh, and the argument is that... Uh, the, the goal of any society, all societies, have norms. We talked about norms uh, the first week of this class. All societies have norms, and the goal for society is to get people to internalize those norms. That's what socialization is all about. We teach children how to obey the rules of society, how to integrate into society, how to absorb the normative order. And so norms are these fundamental rules for how social life is accomplished. But the interesting thing Durkheim says about a rule is that in order for a rule to be worth anything, there have to be people on both sides of it. There's no, uh, uh, you can't chart a boundary unless there is something on either side of the boundary. Otherwise, you don't have a boundary. It's this principle of opposition in all things. In order to have rule keepers, you have to have br rule breakers. In order for people to internalize and uh, assimilate to the rules, we have to be able to point to people who haven't assimilated to the rules. You can't have good you, uh, unless you have bad. You can't be happy unless you've been sad. You uh, don't really know what rich is like until you compare it to poor. You don't really know what bitter tastes like until you compare it to sweet. 
Uh, and you can't have deviance uh, or you can't have conformity unless you have deviance, right? So uh, for Durkheim, crime is necessary to assert the boundaries of the normative order. Uh, and when you have norms, uh, which are rules, you need rule breakers, right? So it's kind of like the idea of colors matching. When you, you know, when I was a kid, uh, it was much more um, important than it is today to make sure that the color you have on the top part of your body matches the color on the bottom of your body. So uh, parents took much more care in matching pants and shirts than they do these days. But still, the whole idea of colors that match uh, depends on the idea of colors that clash. If there aren't colors that clash, then there can't be colors that match. There could only be colors, right? By the same token, if there aren't rule breakers, there can't be rules. There can only be things that we do. So the sort of boundaries that we need in order to define our society have to be there. And Durkheim says, there always has to be things to raise our ire and outrage us. Uh, and uh, the more homogeneous the behavior, the, uh, the smaller the acts are that are considered deviant, right? So think about our society. We have murderers and thieves and all kinds of uh, antisocial behavior. But Durkheim says, imagine a society of saints. Imagine a perfect cloister of angels with no murder, no assault, and no theft. Even in a society like that, Durkheim says, there would be crime because the level of um, sentiment for uh, re reinforcing boundaries between uh, us and them, between conformists and, de conformists and deviants remains constant. So let me give you an example uh, of this idea of deviance in a perfect cloister of angels. <clears throat> so if any of you have ever read the Bible and you know the story of Moses, uh, Moses was a prophet who was chosen by God to lead the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And after they left Egypt, they wandered in the desert of Sinai for 40 years while God sort of forged them into his chosen people. You can read about that this in uh, the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy uh, in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. Uh, and so uh, what ended up happening is you have a people that are ethnically homogeneous, a people who all worship the same God. And, you know, Moses, the lawgiver, came down from Mount Sinai with the law of Moses. I mean, and these were the chosen people. They were a perfect society of saints. So um, what kind of deviance would there be among them? Well, here's a verse, an interesting story from Numbers chapter 15. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, they're wandering around in the desert, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they kept him in custody because it was not clear what should be done to him. Now, work on the Sabbath day is one of the Ten Commandments. Keep the Sabbath day holy. And so this guy was breaking the rules. And they're like, what is this kind of behavior? And so Moses and his brother Aaron apparently go to God and ask God, well, what should we do with this guy who broke the rule about labor on the Sabbath. And uh, verse 35, Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord commanded Moses. Everybody picked up rocks and they threw rocks at the guy until he was dead. Death penalty for working on the Sabbath. And people will say, Wow, what a bunch of barbarians those people were. Uh, can you imagine... Um, uh, you know, these days, most Christians observe the Sabbath on Sunday. Can you imagine if we uh, had the death penalty for mowing your lawn on a Sunday? I mean, how, um, how far would our society have to descend before we would uh, engage in um, uh, that kind of uh, a punitive measure? But really, when you think about it using the ideas of Durkheim, it makes more sense, right? Imagine that all societies have some sort of uh, level of outrage for rule breakers and this outrage remains constant and imagine there's outrage for capital punishment imagine you know this kind of ultimate expiation is something that exists in all societies 
Now, in our society, we only use capital punishment for murderers. But if all murderers were gone, if murder ceased tomorrow, do you think that all support for capital punishment would cease tomorrow? Durkheim would say no. Uh, then he would say, well, we should use it for pedophiles. Or we should use it for, you know, big time drug dealers. And there are already people who uh, favor the death penalty for pedophiles and big time drug dealers. Well, what if there were no murderers and there were no pedophiles and there were no big time drug dealers? And what Durkheim would say is, well, then you'd want to use it on armed robbers or you would use it on burglars. And so what Durkheim is arguing is that you can change the nature of the objective behavior, but the level of subjective outrage uh, always stays the same. And you can whittle away at this crime and that crime, and you can make the society cohesive, and you can make them conform to the point where gathering sticks on the Sabbath, a la Numbers chapter 15, is as outrageous to this perfect cloister of angels, this society of saints, as homicide would be in our society. So using Durkheim's uh, theory, they, the, the Israelites were not a bunch of barbarians. They were just incredibly homogeneous, but they had that same uh, urge to uh, assert the boundaries between what constitutes um, appropriate and inappropriate behavior. So let me give you a little object lesson <clears throat> of what happens. Well, we'll look at how outrage remains constant as society liberalizes, and then we'll look at how outrage remains constant as society uh, becomes more conservative in different areas. Okay, some of you may recognize this couple. Uh, it's definitely before your time. It's actually before my time. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about how families uh, have been portrayed in television sitcoms. This is uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz from the sitcom I Love Lucy. And uh, Lucy and uh, Desi were popular uh, in the 1950s. You can ask your grandparents about I Love Lucy. Some of you may, have be, may be familiar with reruns that are still in syndication on certain uh, TV stations, cable stations. One of the interesting things about I Love Lucy is it was controversial in its time. And it was controversial because it was an inter-ethnic marriage. Uh, Ricky was a Cuban. Uh, and uh, Lucy marrying a Cuban seemed a little bit edgy and controversial. Not only that, uh, uh, in the evening when Lucy and Ricky would sort of sum up their day, it would show them in their bedroom. And here they are in their bedroom. And as you can see, they each have their own twin bed. Now, let me ask you, how many married people do you know uh, that sleep in separate twin beds? Maybe some, but most share a bed. So why didn't Ricky and Lucy share a bed? Well, that would have been considered scandalous. Uh, to show a married couple in the bed together, uh, that would suggest that maybe they might be mm, having sex, uh, and that would be uh, just too much for uh, the youth of America to take. So this is the way that that marriage and families were portrayed um, in the 1950s. As we move into the 60s, you can see that the um, nation began to liberalize with respect to its uh, attitudes. This is the Brady Bunch. <clears throat> I had a hard time finding a screen cap for uh, this slide. <clears throat> the Brady Bunch was a sitcom from the late 60s, early 70s. And when we think about the Brady Bunch today, when I say something like, oh, they're a Brady Bunch family, um, you think about a Goody Two Shoes family. There was a movie that was made uh, about a decade or so ago uh, about the Brady Bunch. And the whole joke was that they were uh, a, a Goody Two Shoes family in a modern age. They were sort of an anach anachronistic family uh, set in uh, modern society. But in its time, the Brady Bunch was incredibly edgy because the family was a blended family. Mike Brady uh, brought to the marriage three sons and his wife Carol brought to the marriage three girls. So there were six kids, three from each parent. And it never says what happened to the father of the girls 
or the mother of the sons. It was completely, you know, it was completely ignored. It was, there was nothing at all said about it. And so you didn't know if maybe they were divorced. How scandalous, you know, to portray uh, divorce in that kind of light where people might be divorced and still be normal, decent human beings, right? That would be too much for the youth of America to bear. Uh, not only that, at the end of the show, when Mike and Carol wrapped up their day, they got in bed together. And uh, uh, this was a shocking scandal. So when I was a kid, I used to come home from school and watch reruns of the Brady Bunch. It was syndicated after school. But when it was a primetime sitcom, it was edgy. And it was pushing the boundaries. Um, and so uh, you think that's uh, sort of laughable by today's standard. But in its time, the Brady Bunch was... Uh, right at the edge. Then, of course, in the 90s, you have Married with Children. And today you have shows like Modern Family, uh, where the families uh, reflect society uh, to a much greater degree than, uh, than you would see in idealized families uh, like uh, Lucy and Ricky or the way we see the Brady Bunch now. But the, you know, I'm looking at these pictures of Christina Applegate when she uh, when she got uh, start, her start as Kelly Bundy. And uh, uh, wow, people were outraged at the um, kinds of things that were in the script of marriage uh, of, of married with children. And, but the interesting thing is that outrage is the same outrage over the Brady Bunch and the same outrage over Lucy and Ricky. So the outrage stayed the same, even though the behavior liberalized. That's what Durkheim is talking about. There's nothing you can do to, uh, to reduce the level of outrage in society. It's constant. This is the album cover to Iron Maiden's Killers. And uh, Iron Maiden was one of the first uh, bona fide heavy metal uh, bands. And I loved Iron Maiden. And this album came out when I was a sophomore. And uh, uh, in those days, albums were on vinyl, and so this glorious album cover uh, was on uh, a 12-inch square canvas, and there's Eddie, Iron Maiden's mascot, uh, holding a hatchet, and as you can see, the hatchet is dripping blood, and his hapless victim is uh, on his knees begging for mercy as he's being hacked to pieces. Uh, Iron Maiden's Killers, uh, a classic album cover. And... Uh, even though my parents were religious, they would pretty much let me listen to whatever music that I wanted, and I really didn't get a lot of hassle. But this was where my mom drew the line. When I brought this home from the record store, my mom said, okay, you can bring the, uh, the record in, but you can't bring that album cover in the house, because that is just... You know, we can't have that in the house. And I remember arguing with her, Mom, the record's going to get scratched and getting all upset. And my uh, grandma was there. And uh, I remember my grandma saying, Ha, huh, this is the exact same argument that you and I had over Elvis. Hmm. Now, uh, think about Elvis in his day. Now, these days, uh, when you go to Vegas, you see all kinds of Elvis impersonators and they are a lounge act for old people and Elvis's music is on the easy listening station but when Elvis was on late night TV the Ed Sullivan show which was the precursor to shows like uh, Kimmel and Fallon when he was on that show the cameras were told to focus on Elvis only from the waist up they were not to show him from the waist down why because his dancing included hip gyrations that you know would uh, destroy the morals uh, of the youth of America, if they were to see Elvis's hips move, it was considered obscene, and we just can't have that. And what my grandma was saying is, you know, the the same outrage that exists over a dude um, that uh, uh, twists his hips is uh, identical to the outrage that you have over a demon with a hatchet hacking up uh, a victim. These two things are functional equivalents. The, uh, 
the level of outrage that a 50-year-old uh, or 60-year-old would express at the photo on the right is the same as the outrage a 50-year-old or a 60-year-old would expre express at the photo on the left uh, two generations ago. So this is what Durkheim is saying, that as society liberalizes, uh, the acts get more and more objectively outrageous, but the level of outrage stays the same. Now, it works going the other way, too. When society tightens up, the outrage stays the same. So, for example, uh, we've already talked about how crime rates were very high in the late 80s and the early 90s. And when this happened, schools started uh, having uh, metal detectors and security, and they started enacting zero tolerance policies for weapons in school. Uh, and there are all kinds of policies written to include harsh punishments for anyone who brought a weapon to school. Uh, well, uh, what ended up happening is the crime rate began to fall and uh, fewer and fewer weapons were being brought to school as the crime rate fell. Uh, but schools had invested in these policies and they had um, uh, hired police officers to be in the school and you know you just can't once you have these things implemented you definitely don't want to cut your budget or you don't want to fire someone you've hired and so what ends up happening is the definition of what constitutes a weapon um, gets less and less and less serious so I have two video clips that I'm going to show you back to back about how absurd this idea of no weapons to school can get when no one's bringing actual weapons to school. And when you look at these, ask yourself, like how crazy are the people that are enforcing these policies? And the answer is, well, they're not crazy. They're just, you know, uh, uh, they are just following Durkheim's principle that the, you know, we have a policy in place. It's no weapons at school. If you have a policy, what good is a policy if you don't have people on uh, the wrong side of the policy. So if people aren't bringing guns and machetes to school, well, we'll just call other things weapons um, uh, and uh, continue to invoke the policy. So watch these two videos and they appear here back to back. This little toy gun caused a real big uproar in Staten Island when nine-year-old Patrick Timoney brought it to school on Tuesday. He was threatened with suspension. You know, traumatize a child who loved to go to school, who wanted to be early every day to school. You don't make them cry. You don't make them fill out statements. You don't do it. But she says Principal Evan Matriani marched Patrick down to the office after she spotted him and his fourth grade buddies playing with these two inch Lego figures at lunchtime. Patrick's toy cop was holding this toy gun. His dad, a real cop, retired, was incensed. You know, I dealt with people carrying imitation weapons. I mean, you have to be using it for a crime, threatening somebody, whatever. And again, the size of this thing. But the principal, they say, called security administrators at the Department of Education while Patrick yeah. sat in her office in tears. Because it was so little and because I don't, I wouldn't really think that the principal would cause a lot of commotion just for a little gun. I don't, I don't think it's, it could harm anybody, you know, it's a toy, a tiny little toy. Would you feel threatened by a little Lego gun? No. No. Wouldn't scare you? No. Department of Education policy states no imitation guns on school property. The Timonies read it online. It said you had to take into account the size, the weight, you know, the, the coloring, whether it looks realistic. Still, a DOE spokesperson says the principal has ultimate discretion, and this one felt there was reason for, quote, concern. If she now thinks this all backfired, she wasn't saying. No comment to the press. You need to exercise good judgment. In my opinion, this was the wrong call. Now we have a story that raises the issue of whether zero tolerance can lead to zero discretion by educators. Zachary Christie and his parents certainly think it can. The six-year-old was suspended for 45 days and may be facing reform school for a situation that will let you judge for yourself. Zachary Christie is every parent's dream, a child who loves school. Most fun is having to do work and... <laughs> Recess and math and science. 
and all that yes, and reading. Which is why his mother Debbie was so confused when she recently got a call. And then I got a call from the principal telling me to come down that Zach um, had carried a dangerous weapon into school and was going to be suspended. Zach is also a Cub Scout and for camping trips his parents bought him this pocket knife with a combination of eating utensils, a spoon, fork and knife. In his excitement he brought it to school. I wasn't really trying to get in trouble, I was just trying to eat lunch with it. The school considers the pocket knife a dangerous item, an immediate cause for suspension and reform school. Zach's mother says it's a tool with eating utensils, not a weapon, and a zero tolerance policy is harming her son and others. The school board president defended the decision to the New York Times, saying there's no parent who wants to get a phone call where they hear someone pulled out a knife, but added the board might adjust the rules for young children. The Christies say they will continue to fight the ruling. It's just that when I'm standing up to the board, I'm kind of proud and it's kind of scary, but I, I know what I have to do and I have to do it. Well, you are a mom. <laughs> Well-spoken six-year-old. I have one at home. Maybe you do. What do you think? The situation begs for the Twitter and the message boards. Please weigh in. Let us know what you think. So that is Durkheim's idea about uh, the idea that um, uh, crime in society remains constant. And uh, we'll have some reading on this, and uh, it'll be something that's important to remember uh, for subsequent lectures coming up in a few weeks.